Welcome to Revelation without the exaggeration. Today we cover chapters 17 and 18 that have to do with Babylon. Now the city of Babylon was founded by a man named Nimrod who is described in the Bible as a mighty hunter. The building of the Tower of Babel is believed by many to be a symbol of man's defiance of God. You see, the Lord had commanded man to spread out and to populate the earth, but mankind instead decided to unite and build, quote, unquote, a name for ourselves. And so the Lord confused their language and they were forced to spread out. Nevertheless, Babylon later became the source of many pagan false religious systems. The queen of heaven was said to come from Babylon. Her name was Semiramis, and she was reported to be Nimrod's uh, wife, the founder of Babylon. According to legend, she gave birth to a son named Tammuz, who was miraculously killed by a sunbeam and then later killed. There's two different versions, at least that I'm aware of, how Tammuz was killed. But he's killed at some point. And Semiramis wept for Tammuz for 40 days, after which time he was resurrected after the 40 days. That legend later morphed into variations uh, in different parts of the world. The worship of Baal, who we, we, we read quite a bit about in the Bible, is a variation of the Tammuz legend. In fact, Jesus is considered by some secular scholars to be yet another version of the Tammuz legend. And best observed, they say, in Catholicism. For example, you have this unique mother-son relationship with Semiramis and Tammuz, and you have the same thing with Mary and Jesus. You have the 40 days of weeping for Tammuz before he is resurrected. You have the 40 days of Lent before Easter. And speaking of Easter, the sign of Tammuz was an egg, which was a symbol of the resurrection to life. And after 40 days of weeping, there was a feast where eggs were exchanged to celebrate Tammuz's resurrection. Now, interestingly enough, both Jeremiah, the prophet, and Ezekiel, the prophet, refer to this worship of the Queen of Heaven and Tammuz. In Jeremiah 7, in verse 18, it says, The children gather wood, the fathers light the fire, and the women knead the dough, and make cakes of bread. Who are they making them for? For the queen of heaven. They pour out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. And then in Ezekiel 8, verse 14, Then he brought me to the entrance to the north gate of the house of the Lord, and I saw women sitting there, mourning for who? Mourning for Tammuz. So in chapter 17 and 18, there's a focus on the judgment of Babylon. In chapter 17, the false religious system that we can trace all the way back to Nimrod and Semiramis and Tammuz is judged. And in chapter 18, the commercial enterprise of Babylon is judged. Now, The question is, is Babylon the actual city that is being referred to because there is a Babylon in the nation we know as Iraq? Or is Babylon a symbol for some other city, such as in chapter 11 of Revelation, we saw that Jerusalem was referred to as Egypt and Sodom. If it is symbolic, the most likely candidate, I think at least, is Rome. 
However, the actual city of Babylon is being rebuilt, and the United States is <coughs> helping with that. And therefore, some think that the actual city of Babylon will rise to prominence over time, particularly in the tribulation period. Maybe. <laughs> it's, it's hard to imagine right now. It's mostly just the mud and brick place. Uh, the rebuilding presently going on is a far cry from a functional, industrial, and commercial complex. It is mostly right now just a preservation effort of the old city of Babylon. There is no effort really to turn it into a modern city. In any event, whether you believe Babylon in the Bible, in the book of Revelation in particular, symbolizes Rome or it is the actual city of ancient Babylon, uh, here once again for our purposes, it doesn't really matter which one of those is true. Because no matter <coughs> which of those is correct, it falls. And when this judgment occurs in the midst of the seals, trumpets, and bowls, it's difficult to determine. But most believe that the religious judgment of chapter 17 probably occurs at or near the midpoint of the tribulation before the Antichrist takes full control. And the political commercial judgment of Babylon in chapter 18 is thought to be closer to the end of the tribulation when the Antichrist is starting to lose control. All right, let's take a look at it here in Revelation 17, beginning in verse 1. One of the angels who had the seven bowls came, <coughs> came to me and said, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Now, one of the seven angels in chapter 16 who had one of the seven bowls invited John to witness the punishment of the great prostitute who sits on the many waters. The great prostitute symbolizes the religious system of Babylon, and the waters she sits upon, we're told later in verse 15, uh, refer to peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. And so the angel informed John that the kings of the earth had committed adultery with this woman. In other words, they had become a part of this false religious system, which she symbolizes, and they <coughs> had committed spiritual adultery with her. Verse 3, then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a desert, and there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet or red beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This title was written on her forehead, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the Mother of Prostitutes, and of the Abominations of the Earth. So John is taken by the Spirit to a desert where he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. Now the question is, She's sitting on this beast. Is she sitting on the beast in the sense that she is riding and controlling the beast like a rider who controls the horse when the rider is riding the horse? Or does this mean to suggest she is being carried by the beast, which is more along the lines of saying she is riding the beast's coattails? And I tend to think that latter is true. I think the beast is using her to accomplish his initial goals, but when he no longer needs her, he dumps her like a horse throwing its rider. We're told the beast she rides has seven heads and ten horns, which is the same description given of the red dragon and the Antichrist earlier. 
The 10 horns are later defined in verse 12 as 10 kings who had not yet received a kingdom. The seven heads, as we have discussed previously, I believe refer to seven world empires. The woman that is sitting on the beast, this prostitute is wealthy. She is dressed in purple and scarlet. She is glittering with gold and precious stones and pearls, and wealth means power. She is the mother of all false religious systems that permeate each world empire. In other words, this woman has been around for a long time. After the Persians took over Babylon in 539 B.C., they discouraged what were called the mystery religions of Babylon. Subsequently, the Babylonian cultists moved to a city called Pergamum, which you'll remember is one of the seven churches in Asia Minor to whom John is instructed to write. And in that letter to the church at Pergamum, we're told that Satan's throne is there. Now, Semiramis, according to legend, was the child of the fish god, which is why crowns in the shape of a fish head were worn by the priest of the Babylonian cult to honor this fish god. Their crowns bore the words, keeper of the bridge, symbolic of the bridge between man and these false gods. Now, the Roman emperors thought, hey, that's kind of catchy. So they adopted it, and in Latin, the term keeper of the bridge is Pontifex Maximus. And unfortunately, that same title was later used by the Bishop of Rome, who became the Pope, which is why some people believe, in case you've ever wondered, some people believe the false religion of the tribulation is the Catholic Church. They also see in Mary and Jesus the continuation of the Semiramis Tammuz cult. Now, that is not my view. My own view is that this false religious system of the tribulation might have what we might call Catholic-like qualities, but it is not the Catholic Church. I do not see the Catholic Church abandoning Jesus as the object of worship in order to worship the Antichrist. Remember, Satan is mimicking the true God, and in God's kingdom, Jesus has his bride, the church, and in Satan's kingdom, the Antichrist has his woman. And his woman is this great harlot of Babylon. And Jesus is faithful to his bride, but the Antichrist is not, as we shall see. Verse 6. I saw that the woman was drunk. What is she drunk with? The blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. What we learn here is that false religious systems always persecute true religious systems. This is why so many believers are martyred in the first half of the tribulation. This false religious system will attempt to kill all those who bear witness in true faith to Jesus Christ. And John found this astonishing. Then the angel said to me, why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. And now here's the explanation in verse 8. The beast which you saw once was... I believe that <laughs> that is a reference to the old <laughs> Roman Empire. The beast which you saw once was, now is, the Roman Empire is fallen, it's not now, and will come up out of the abyss. I believe that the Antichrist world empire is basically a revived Rome. And go to his destruction, the Inhabitants of the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world. Remember, we talked about the book of life. Some people think names are erased. Some people think because of this verse, uh, only the people who are going to be saved are written in there. Um, other people think that everybody's name is written in the book of life, and then they're erased when they don't become saved. We're not really told a whole lot about the book, so it's hard to you know, say anything with certainty. 
But anyway, the inhabitants of the earth, those whose names have not been written in the book of life from creation of the world, these are unbelievers, will be astonished when they see the beast because he once was, now is not, and yet will come. So the angel explains the meaning of the woman and the beast she was riding. The beast, we're told, comes out of the abyss. Well, the Antichrist didn't come out of the abyss. The Antichrist came out of the sea. Satan came out of the abyss back in chapter 13. This seems to suggest she's being carried along by Satan. But we're also told that the beast she is riding once was, now is not, and yet will come. Well, that part does not apply to Satan. And so what do I think is happening here? I think what is happening is that this is a, to be applied to the Antichrist who is basically the false uh, prophetess, this uh, prostitute is riding the beast, which is the Antichrist, who in essence is being carried along by Satan. And it's all kind of just mashed into this one uh, composite. Remember, the second beast, the, the Antichrist, uh, looks just like his daddy. The first beast, the dragon. They both have seven heads and ten horns. And what I think this is suggesting, again, Satan is trying to mimic the true. We're told in the Bible repeatedly that God the Son and God the Father are one. And in Hebrews, God the Son is said to be the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being. And so I think that this is what Satan and the Antichrist are mimicking here. They can also be viewed or considered as one. The reference then is simply to remind us that the real power behind the Antichrist is Satan, and the power behind the prostitute is the Antichrist. And so to ride on the Antichrist, be carried along by the Antichrist, is to be carried along by Satan. Their power is one. The fact that the beast was, now is not, and will come up in the future, I believe, as I just mentioned, is a reference to the supernatural revival of this world empire, which is a revived Roman empire that is controlled by the beast. Now, even the angel admits <laughs> that this is a bit of a head scratcher. Look at verse 9. This calls for wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. So the seven heads or seven hills or seven kings. Five have fallen. One is. The other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for a little while. The beast who once was and now is not is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going down to his destruction. Wow, there's a lot to chew on in those verses, the truth that is being presented here symbolically, according to the angel, requires spiritual insight to be understood. And the difficulty of correct interpretation is illustrated by the various ways in which it has been interpreted throughout the history of the church. Now, the angel, let's start there, begins by informing that the beast heads are seven hills or mountains upon which the woman sits. Many ancient writers wrote that the seven hills refer to the city of Rome. Rome was sometimes identified and described as the city of seven hills. This identification has led to the conclusion that this passage teaches that Rome will be the capital of the coming world empire. A close study of the passage seems to demonstrate Obviously, the, several, the, the seven mountains are not literal mountains. We're told they're seven kings. So they're not really mountains, they're really seven kings. 
In the Bible, mountains and hills are often symbols of government and or leaders of government. And often a leader, a king and his kingdom, are considered as one. What happens to the king happens to the kingdom. What happens to the kingdom happens to the king. If the mountains represent kings, then obviously they are not literal mountains. So this in and of itself does not help us identify the city. John has told five kings and kingdoms have fallen, which I believe, as we saw some, one other occasion, <laughs> I can't remember what it was now, uh, the five kingdoms that have fallen, world empires that have fallen, are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. The one is, at the writing of the book of Revelation, the one that is in play then is the Roman Empire, and the other one has not yet come, which is the Beast Empire, which is, I believe, a revived Rome. But we're told when he does come, he will remain for a little while. The Antichrist power is only through the seven years of the tribulation. And only in the latter half of the tribulation, the latter three and a half years, does he really gain full power. So he's not king for long. Well, what did the angel mean when he says the beast is part of the seven kings and yet is also an eighth king? Well, here's what I think that means. The Antichrist is a seventh king because he's part of those seven world empires. Five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. But he does not start out as a world dictator. When the Antichrist comes on <laughs> the scene, he is powerful, but he does not control those 10 regions, those 10 kings and kingdoms. He only controls three of them. The beast does not gain full control as an absolute dictator until after the midpoint of the tribulation. So he's the seventh king in that he's part of this revived Roman Empire, and he is probably a first among equals. He has the most power, but he doesn't have total power. And in the latter half of the tribulation, he shares with no one and becomes a world dictator by himself. That is when he becomes an eighth king. Look at verse 12. The 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but who for one hour, for a short period of time, will receive authority as kings along with the beast. So the beast shares power with them. In verse 13, they will have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. At some point, they turn over total control to him. And they will make war against the lamb, but the lamb will overcome them because he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and with him will be his called chosen and faithful followers. Verse 15, the angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and language. So she has influence over all people, multitudes, nations, and languages. Verse 16, the beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by, agree by agreeing to do what? to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. So the chapter closes with this dramatic destruction of the woman, and apparently the beast uses the great prostitute to rule and influence, but resents having to do so, hates her. At some point, the 10 kings give all their power over to the beast. Again, that is when he becomes the eighth king, at which time he then dumps 
the great prostitute as he no longer needs her services. He's in total control now. So when the Antichrist comes as an absolute dictator, he will come to assume the place of God and demand that everybody worship him or else be killed. You see, he too believes in the principle that no one should have any other gods before him. So he eliminates all competition by destroying this great harlot. The false religious movement, which characterizes the first half of the tribulation, is then brought to an abrupt end, and it will be replaced by worship of the one world ruler, Satan's substitute for Christ. So the final description of the woman is that she's a great city. So that's pretty easy to figure out, right? So the woman is a city. Uh, like Babylon, which is the religious center for false religion. This religious system is destroyed somewhere, again, around the midpoint of the tribulation. And now we go to when the commercial enterprise of Babylon is destroyed, which is toward the end of the tribulation, and that is in Revelation 18. Okay, verse 1. After this, I saw another angel come down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. The reason I think it says fallen twice, because first Babylon falls as a religious center, then it falls as a uh, commercial center. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich in her excessive luxuries. Further revelation on the destruction of Babylon was made by another angel coming down from heaven. This angel's message is summarized and simply fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. The woman in chapter 17 was associated with political power, but her destruction brought no mourning uh, from the earth. By contrast, in chapter 18, when the commercial enterprise of Babylon is destroyed, it brings loud lamentation from the earth's political and economic powers. Instead of being destroyed and consumed by the 10 kings, here the destruction seems to come from an earthquake and it is probable that this is an enlarged explanation of what happens in chapter 16 with reference to the seventh bowl of wrath being poured out upon the earth. What is pictured here is a large prosperous city, the center of political and economic life, and apparently for a while, the great prostitute had been good for business. And while the city brought riches to, mer to merchants, it is now... That time's over. It's doomed for destruction. Verse 4, then I heard another voice from heaven say, come out of her, my people. So any believers that are in this area, they need to get at this point so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not re receive any of her plague, plagues for her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she is, as she is given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen, I am not a widow, <coughs> and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. So, a lot of terrible things are going to happen now to the city of Babylon. Verse 9, when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her, terrified at her torment. They will stand far off and cry, woe, woe, again, twice. O great city, O Babylon, city of power, in one hour your doom has come. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore, cargoes of gold, silver, precious stone, and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood, 
and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble, cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh, and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages, and bodies and souls of men. So apparently slavery is still going on then. They will say, verse 14, the fruit you longed for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchant who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at her torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, woe, woe, a great city dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. Rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her. Why? For the way she treated you. So when the kings who were involved with the city see its destructions, they're grieved. The merchants bemoan the city's downfall since they'll no longer be able to carry on commerce with the city. The description in verses 12 to 13 indicates the great luxury and wealth of the city that has now come to ruin. So this obviously is referring to an economic, commercial <laughs> situation, political situation not a religious one like we saw in chapter 17. All three groups, kings, merchants, sailors, speak of her destruction in one hour. And as the world mourns the destruction of Babylon, the saints are told to rejoice. Verse 21, then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said, with such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down. Never to be found again. The music of harpists, the musicians, flute players, and trumpeteers will never be heard in you again. No joy. No workmen of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of the lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of the bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's great men. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who have been killed on the earth. So the final destruction of the city is compared to throwing a large millstone into the sea. And all music and happiness go down with the city. There's only gloom and doom, no joy. And so with chapters 17 and 18 giving us additional insight and information concerning the earth's major religious and political movements during the final seven years of the tribulation, the stage is now set for where all of this has been leading. The second coming of Christ, which we will get to next week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you once again for your word. Lord, we are part of that group in this chapter that is rejoicing over this city's destruction because what was found in her was the blood of the prophets and the saints and all those who had been killed on the earth. We thank you for revealing to us our ultimate victory and we praise you for this in Jesus' name. Amen.